I want to take some time to recognize and welcome our faculty, our students, um, as well as our industry partners that are joining us. Um, and thank Paul Forbes for making this connection to make this happen for us today. And um, recognize our department head, Dr. Burris, who is here as well. We're delighted to have Ishmael Amin from DXC talking to us today. Um, in 2015, Mr. Amin set his career path towards completing his master's in data science and in artificial intelligence at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. He's now part of the graduating class of 2020 and he holds a bachelor's in statistical science from UC Santa Barbara. He has a deep fundamental understanding of statistical science and he's worked in the IT industry for more than 24 years. He's been instrumental in performing data science for Fortune 500 clients business development, advising, leading, and developing the talent of the digital analytics uh, capability within DXC. Mr. Amon is the lead data scientist and data science manager for DXC Technology, who supervises over 40 data scientists, data engineers, and ETL DBAs. His excellent soft skills have made him an ambassador to represent the NOLA service line analytics capabilities and to build relationships with our university, as well as other uni the university outreach programs with LSU, UNO, and other universities. And along with the, uh, client billable work, he engages clients during RFP oral sales pursuit presentations. He's a communicator who can identify, cultivate, and mentor the talents of other analytics members. Mr. Amon's work ethos is to provide cutting edge analytical solutions to keep current with technologies and to be relevant in the field of data science, to provide business development and to flourish within his profession. Data science is an interdisciplinary field that allows him to draw upon his diverse knowledge gained by studying and practicing the disciplines of data science, statistical science and computer science. Mr. Amon is eager to learn new business domains by con constantly seeking to understand how things work at their applied and theoretical levels using principal sources of knowledge. Data science appeals to his sense of purpose and passion to provide services of value. And so without further ado, I give to you, Mr. Ishmael Amin. Oh, okay. thank you very much. Thank you very much for that intro that I wrote. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so I'm kind of laughing because that's the first time I've heard it spoken. It sound, it's pretty spot on. The only thing it's missing a few more things that I'd, I'd added to it. Um, I am a drummer and um, and I've and I gig and um, I haven't really played in uh, the New Orleans area too much, um, but I think that I tap into that that musician creativity um, when it comes to data science and when it comes to um, building a team and um, you know the. The members of my team are, are players, they're performers, and and I think about how we can um, prepare for the next gig all the time. So I'm trying to get my um, screen ready so I can present here. Uh, let me know if you can see my screen. Which one are you seeing? Uh, let me see. I think this is it. Okay. All right. Hmm. Okay. Without further ado. Um, so today I'll, I want to talk about team building. Um, team building within the context of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data science. Um, when it comes to building a team, there's a few different aspects we want to touch upon. One is psychological safety. Also, we want to talk about um, some of our, what, what Gardner calls a target state or different uh, key objectives that we'd like to reach within the context of building a team. And then um, meeting expectations. We, there's a vast amount of skills that are required in data science um, and AI and ML and, and so there's a lot of expectations. So how do we meet those expectations? 
And also we're going to look at the um, Gardner's AI quadrant and how that relates to skills and um, some other things. And um, also I'd like to cover um, how we create a professional guild. This is where we're going to get more into <clears throat> how the guild and guild presentations. And when I think of the guild, I think of the band and how we get the band together to, to meet our, to, to become better. So um, first I'd like to talk about um, Google's quest to build the perfect team. And psychological safety is one of the things that Google was able to extrapolate from uh, years of study. <clears throat> and in the context of building a perfect team, um, psychological safety is similar to the concept of, you know, say that you have a football team and, or you can say, well, I won't name any college teams because that might rile some people up, but uh, it's just, you have the saints and say the saints are, um, have some play that's blown. Now, a good team, and Saints are a good team, they come back to the huddle and there's, they stay positive. They're like, you know, good show, good show. You know, there's, it's very positive reinforcement. It's not a negative environment. And that's where, you know, when it comes to psychological safety, there's a sense of confidence that the team um, members have that they're not going to be embarrassed or rejected or punished when they, in this context of speaking up from, um, um, Amy Hudson's um, Edmondson um, presentation with um, Harvard University, which was captured in the New York Times magazine. And the concept of psychological safety is, is, is kind of a cornerstone for the team building and staying positive. And when we think of that, that context, we also want to think about some of the objectives and the path to going forward. Um, when I think about AI, ML, and data science, DS, <clears throat> um, Gardner kind of outlines a, a path forward. And one of the first things that we want to do is cultivate a culture of smart individuals, um, individuals who are creative, um, who are uh, positive and and um, forward thinking and um, excuse me mr. Amon um, yes are you, sharing, are you sharing your screen I'm not seeing that you, you you're not seeing my screen that? I'm not seeing your screen I'm sorry okay well it's good that you told me did it stop sharing it may oh, have wait. no wait I may be doing something wrong yeah. on my end but oh, sorry an error occurred can't scare Oh, wait. So I've been talking. You haven't seen anything. I haven't seen it. I've been let me, looking around. Let me let me try. My settings. Uh, let's see. I will try again. There it is. Okay, what can, sure, what can you see? Do you see the PowerPoint? I do see the PowerPoint. Target states and now uh, agenda. Okay. And, yeah, lead slide. Okay. Okay, sorry. so, okay. I I had up. No, 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 I'm glad I, I um, sorry we hadn't, yeah, okay, so um, this is a intro slide and I've talked, this is the, these are the topics that I mentioned earlier and Google's quest to build a perfect team. And um, the quest to build a perfect team, I talked about um, the Saints and being a positive team, positive reinforcement, always working hard to get better and um, um, learn, develop, and, um, and strategize to move forward. <clears throat> and here I'm talking about Gardner's, tar tar what they call the target states. And they've broken it into five different components. Um, and this is where we, we start off with a 
how we cultivate a culture. And that's why I started off with the, the topic of, um, of um, psychological safety, because I think that that's a really important aspect of things. Um, you know, when you have a team that, that's brought together, um, one of the, one of the, one of the aspects that was um, covered within the article of, um, of Google explaining how to build a perfect team was the fact that you want a, to build a team where um, individuals all have a say. They all have an equal voice. You want to be able to hear from the, um, the youngest person in the group to the oldest person. Um, you want to hear from individuals with different talents and backgrounds. And, and also you want to have emotional intelligence or IQ. Emotional IQ is very important. And also you want to be able to laugh you know, when it comes to, to, to building that culture of psychological safety. And that's where, within the context of the study, that's where creativity flourishes, when you have that safe zone. Um, I think that that's like one of the most important things that you can have within a group. And in light of all the chaos that's going on in the world, it's a place where you can come together and joke and laugh is, is, is where really, really where you start to look at things from different perspectives. And when it comes to AI and machine learning, it's about being on the bleeding edge of doing something that's never been done before often. It's not about just following someone else's trail. Um, it's about seeing things from a different perspective. And the way we see that is by sharing ideas. And I, 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 that's the most important thing I wanna sh uh, share. Um, and then once we get that understanding, then that's where we start to grow. <clears throat> and the second um, step in this is expand. Um, when we think about expanding AI and ML capabilities as well as di uh, data, big data, um, we want to think about our customers, but also it's a two-way communication. It's not just, oh, we're making them happy, but it's listening to our customers, uh, sharing our ideas, but also anticipating the next move from a chess game perspective thinking about um, how we go to the next level. One of the things that, you know, from, you know, my intro, you all know that I have a, a master's in data science, but it doesn't mean that I know everything. What it really means is that I, I have a fundamental understanding of data science and artificial intelligence. But one of the things that I carry with me and that I share with others in my team is to carry the spirit of the university with me, meaning that I always learn and I always take the opportunity to see what others have done in the sense of, in the context of um, data science <clears throat> and machine learning or um, what have you. Um, for example, you know, a client may say, I want X, Y, Z. Well, one of the first things I'll do is research and look at articles, literature, review. I mean, it really comes back to the basics of, of the research skills that you find and develop at the, at the universities. And taking that, that practice with us in the professional world is just as important as it is in our research and writing a thesis or dissertation or capstone project. Because one is that we always want to keep learning um, and stay abreast of the latest and greatest ideas. And um, with that practice, that's how we move forward. And we increase our awareness. <clears throat> we increase our awareness of the, what the competition is doing, what the, what's the latest and greatest thing. We want to look at different um, webinars that are happening to be aware of the technology that's that's um, being developed, and when we think about creating and developing, I'm sorry, delivering um, innovation, um, how do we do that? Well, you know, we come in with a set of knowledge, 
and we need to grow. We need to differentiate ourselves. And um, I kind of think about it like jazz, you know, jazz, you kind of understand um, some of the core patterns that are being played, but everyone so often an individual will improvise and ad lib and, um, and create something unique. And that's where that um, creativity comes into play. Oftentimes that comes from someone who is passionate about what they're doing going outside of um, the normal um, path and then maybe studying um, something new and creative on, and doing it on their own. I have a, a, a funny story of, a, you know, one of my cohort, uh, coworkers who took it upon himself to create a robot well, he wanted the robot to retrieve a beer for him, <laughs> which was, uh, I thought it was interesting. It's like, I'm going to, I'm going to code, um, use AI to, to have a, a robot recognize a can of beer and be able to grab it and, and retrieve it to me. I mean, that was, uh, one is, two, it's very creative. And he's taking advantage of the latest and greatest technologies to do something really fun and innovative. And, and, he, and he did that. He posted it on GitHub. Um, and that was just um, one of the small things that the individuals, that we try to encourage with individuals to do things that are fun and that um, enhance the capability that they've, um, that they'll, will eventually be able to deliver. And um, that's where it comes into play where you you do these innovative things that are creative that you think are fun and all of a sudden the customer comes along and says, hey, I want something that does this, this, and this. And you go, well, hey, didn't we do something similar to that, similar to that um, a few days ago or a few weeks ago, a month or two ago, just for fun? And what if we made a little tweak to this? And doesn't this kind of like, you know, look like the what they're looking for. And when you do those kind of things, that's how you, um, you move the needle. And it comes back to meeting expectations. Um, when it comes to AI, ML, data in general, I mean, there's, there's a gambit of, of um, skills that, are often rattled off as far as what a what a d true data this is and does and um, you know we we have those business domain we can start off with that right we can start off with coding skills we can start off also with statistics <clears throat> and that all that comes together and all those skills can be overwhelming and oftentimes when we come out of um, come out of school, we, we hope that we can come close to holding the title of a data scientist and being able to do those things. I think that the closest we can do is come close to touching upon a lot of different topics, but always understanding that there's room for growth and room for future development. When I look at a Venn diagram like this, um, I am reminded of the unevenness in individuals' strengths when it comes to this Venn diagram. I think of, I kind of visualize, like say, like say that uh, you know this, your hacking skills are, are are strong, and say your statistics skills are equally strong, but say your marketing skills are small and diminished. So that this Venn diagram might seem actually lopsided, but the goal. The goal is to work on your weakness. Um, identify your weakness. Think about how you can improve it. Do the research. Do the work. And and be vulnerable. Be, be vulnerable to try new things. And um, learn. Be inquisitive. I think that's one of the most important things as well is to always think about how you can grow and how you can develop those skills. Because... Um, I, I, <clears throat> you know, this isn't about 
me rattling off her curriculum is really about the human spirit because when it comes down to it, um, there's there's no there there was a time when the label of data scientist didn't exist, but I would say that there's always been data scientists, and they were the individuals who were self motivated to learn new things and always to not take on a, a, a label of I'm only this or I'm only that. One of the things that I've, um, I've talked recently about with um, some of my cohort, uh, teammates or some of the individuals who I supervise, I will, you know, might send them off to a webinar and say, Hey, I want you to learn this. <clears throat> and they'll go to it and they go, that was full of a bunch of developers. I'm like, yeah, so? <laughs> I mean, you got to think, like, basically, um, it doesn't matter because the data scientist needs to understand how to work with data, how to build, work with data structures, how to work with algorithms, um, how to understand how to read and, and write object code occasionally or work with web <clears throat> web um, websites, web services, API calls. I mean, it goes on and on. So you want to, in my career, I've had an opportunity to really go deep dive into different areas, um, deep dive in data science. But before then, it was a deep dive in software engineering, deep dive into database administration, database architecture. And you want to, when you have that clear understanding, that's when you can begin to communicate with individuals outside of your immediate discipline and work effectively as a team member and a team lead. So, um, in this right here, um, what I want to talk about here is um, Gardner and um, the things we need to do. And I've talked a lot about <clears throat> innovation and how when we're creative and inspired, we come up with cool things. And it's all about doing the cool things. But the, you know, Gardner says, these are the things that as a company, we need to do. We need to come up with new products. We need to be innovative. We can't just take, we can't just learn one thing and, and, and play it over and over again. It's like, it's like a musician playing a song over and over again. And he never learns a new song. You're like, dude, <laughs> that's, uh, you know, I'm tired and you turn the station, right? So in the context of data science, we want to think about new refreshing ideas, how we can develop new products, um, how we can deliver. Um, and as you can see from this quadrant, it's, it's, there's a high benefit. It's, it is complex. There's a reward in things that are more um, difficult. Oftentimes they're more cool because they're unique. I'm thinking of deep learning, <clears throat> things that are um, augmented reality, things that are outside the box where you you see it and you think about, well, what if it did this extra thing and working towards that? Um, and so how do we get there? And how do we, how do we build a team? How do we take a loose band of individuals who are working on different consulting projects and move the needle uh, forward as they, as new technologies are brought upon us. How do we, um, how do we do that? Well, one of the ways that I've tapped into that is by um, performing, uh, forming professional guilds. And um, part of that formation of the guild, we start out by essentially kind of establishing the culture um, and giving a framework for that. So one of the things that I, I stated within our guild formation is we want to commit ourselves to psychological safety and kind of talk about cultivate leadership. And I, I, I explained what those things were. And we want to present things that we've learned in life and things that we're passionate about. One of those ideas I explained explain to you is the idea of a robot retrieving beer, <laughs> which is, is kind of fun. And then also, you know, looking at presenting papers that we find interesting, um, you know, exploring the, the landscape and looking at 
the relevant topics that are out there, but understanding um, um, interesting articles and findings that we can um, come across that um, can help us get a better understanding of where the industry is going. And um, especially, um, you know, guest speakers and other things. So, all these, all these things lead towards um, cultivating uh, a spirit of of the carrying the university forward. I, I, um, I have we we have had uh, speakers from uh, CLU at uh, come to our group. Excuse me, <clears throat> and. Um, and do our group presentation. So, um, I'm not sure if this little button showed, but um, we, I, I do have an interesting story I'll tell in a little bit once once it seems appropriate. <clears throat> um, so, how do we put things in motion? And I've kind of this is kind of a, a synopsis of all those different ideas that I've I've been talking about as far as what are the contributing factors to innovation and how the guild, how the, the mechanism and framework of the guild can, can, can help with that. And um, I think that, um, you know, first is building the community, um, get to, getting to know your teammates um, and understanding where they're coming from and one of the ways we can do that is by um, one of the things we did actually was we formed uh, small groups or teams together. And these teams um, would work on um, POCs or proof of concepts and step through kind of like a, cl a classroom setting where there's a group project. I think that oftentimes the master's programs have this where um, they'll get a group of four, between four to you know, eight, seven people together um, to work on a certain project. He divides up the work amongst themselves, and it's a self-motivated team um, that is working on a, a project that they come up with. And <clears throat> what, we, what we do during that process is we step through and we um, – and um, it's somewhat structured in the sense that there's a certain target targeted um, objectives. But um, within that context, what we, what we strive to do is to master uh, cloud technology, um, machine learning, and, you know, look for opportunities to, you know, utilize operation research in the form of decision analytics, um, and our algorithmic skills, and then also coding. And, um, ML ops is kind of the future and where we really as data scientists, that's where we, we need, we're going to grow the most is by not only uh, creating the model, but actually put it in production and monitoring the performance of that model and being able to tweak the model uh, in real time and understand how that works and working with dynamic data, not, not static data. Um, and also the concept of developing our soft skills, um, being able to speak, being able to put presentations together, um, being able to share new ideas, and also developing individual character. Um, that's always important um, to be able to, to work with clients and to be customer client facing and to be able to speak well. And these are um, all important skills and one of the things that we've done too is worked with universities. Um, most recently, George Washington University. Um, we worked with that group, that that school, and um, and some of the the, the uh, students to to help a class of um, individuals get their masters in analytics. And um, and um, you know, it all comes together um, to 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 have a team that's ready to innovate. And um, what I'd like to do right now is just kind of cover a, a few topics or uh, that we've covered in the past. <clears throat> and um, as you, uh, back in September last year, um, uh, Dr. Omar. Uh, 
spoke at our guild meeting. Um, I don't have the top. I'm not sure if um, Dr. Mars on the uh, on the call, but I forget the exact topic. Um, but it was definitely it was a pleasure to have him, and his brother um, is actually works at DXC, <laughs> so that's kind of cool. Um, uh, this is the um, I can go through. This is like a slideshow, so I hope I don't, I don't bore. You. But um, if you guys have any questions, just you know speak out. Um, so healthcare analytics. This is another topic that we cover with George Washington University. Um, this was part of their capstone. And Justin Sonyad of DXC um, led this team. <clears throat> and I was part, I participated in this group as well and um, working on it and meeting with them on a weekly basis and checking in with them and encouraging them to learn and, and try new techniques to analyze the data. Um, here's another topic of, um, you know, looking at Azure Machine Learning Studio. Uh, he would slide out uh, did this um, uh, before his uh, UNO student body. Um, Ryan Marinelli did a great presentation on intro to quantum computing and using Python. You know, these are topics that were of interest to him, and they shared with the group. Um, integration of Azure Databricks with R Studio and DXC GitHub. This is a topic that I brought to the um, brought together a team of folks and um, looking at Databricks. Oftentimes, the the default is to use Python, but individual some individuals are really um, love R and R Studio are kind of stuck to use it use what's on their desktop, but being able to integrate that into a cloud platform really uh, gives them a lot of um, power um, to, to move forward. So being able to show different pathways to, um, to success and to be able to um, innovate. Um, shiny apps, understanding how Shiny apps work in different platforms since open source are. And um, Ryan gave a good presentation on this. I believe during this presentation, we actually had um, um, Tulane University students who uh, attended our guild meeting and um, were able to participate and learn from that presentation. Um, and this one is on Informatica by Chandra, where we talked about um, we talked during this during this um, lab. We actually talked about um, data warehousing. Um, and Informatica, and you kind of broke it down for everyone. And Informatica is a, a high demand um, uh, tool in these days. Um, and this one was kind of cool. We actually looked at UI UX design and how um, how to, how the different groups think differently. Like as far as data scientists, it was a kind of opportunity for data scientists to work with another organization and to see things through their eye to understand how they interpreted requirements and, and to share how they could be creative. Um, that was always, that was a very um, interesting presentation. So at this point, I'm ready for questions. Can you guys hear me? Hello? I oh. think we're here. It looks like everybody's mic is off. Oh, that's OK. So I think we have a question in the room. I'm going to have him come closer. This is Dr. Regis. Oh, hey. Um, Hi, uh, I think I was at that uh, gathering outside of uh, uh, the bar. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, have, I have a question. Uh, what is the skill set, like the, the one thing, or at least the, maybe there's one thing, that uh, you've seen like new uh, folks joining the workforce, the one skill that uh, you wish they had but, uh, you know, they're missing? Something that is maybe overlooked in academia. Uh, uh, 
is there uh, such okay. thing? Okay, I have to admit, I have to admit that I heard part part of the question because it broke up, but I think that you you um, you asked me if there was a skill that um, I saw that was lacking in uh, individuals who were hired um, as data scientists. Is that what I'm hearing? Okay, okay. Well, um, I think the typically. So it comes down to big data because that's what we deal with. So um, data science is often trained to work with models, develop models, understand models. But in the and they're often given a data set that's perfect. And you know they'll go through and maybe there's missing data. They'll have to do some data managing to clean up and things of that nature. But the idea of starting from scratch meaning that you have a transactional database and you say the client wants you to do something with that data. Well, first off, the data, you, as a data scientist, you may or may not know this coming in, but as you become more senior, you understand that, okay, well, from before I even touch this, what, what are the pieces that need to be in place for me to um, run the reports or get these reports that the client wants. And building data warehouses and understanding data warehouse architecture is, is a skill that um, needs to be um, formed. And, um, and I would say that's probably the number one thing that comes to mind. Um, and there's other things as well. But essentially, getting your hands dirty with um, cloud technology, um, working with the data lake. Um, in the real world, it's, it's really about working with systems and working with dynamic data. And oftentimes, you know, the client doesn't know what they want. They're not gonna give you a nice data set unless you articulate what you need. But all the, also, you need to be able to articulate I need these events to be, you know, um, organized in a cer certain manner for me to before I can even, you know, proceed. So those are the essentially it's kind of t going from the di two different pendulums of here's a data scientist, here's a data engineer. Well, the data scientist is lacking in data engineering skills, and if you have a strong data engineer, he may be lacking data modeling skills. So oftentimes, what you, what happens is you want those skill sets to be kind of migrated. You know, the data scientists, you want to be slowly learn more and more about data engineering. And I guess if you have a data engineer, you actually want them to start moving more and more towards data modeling. So I know that was a long-winded question or answer. I'm sorry, uh, long-winded answer, but hopefully it was, it was worth listening to. Um, okay, I, I hear, is this Bor uh, Burris? Uh, at what point? In my career, did data science, machine learning, et cetera, become more than a skill and instead be a basis for your career? Um, that's a that's a tough one. Um, I think I think it was the. Um, oh, I, I guess when I worked at I worked at the. Um, city of New Orleans and um, my job at the city of New Orleans at that point was city resilience uh, and creating, uh, conducting, I had to formulate uh, city resilient projects and smarter city research, understanding smarter city technology. And I started to dig into that to understand the different technologies and also understand the capability of what technology was able to do. And uh, all this, a lot of these things were premised on statistics that were part of my um, DNA because that was my, my bachelor's was in st uh, statistical science. And so essentially, and also AI, AI was always this kind of technology that geeky people learn, but was never, <laughs> never, applicable because there was, you know, the computing power wasn't there. And <clears throat> I'd always kept 
technology. But AI up to that point was just kind of like, just something more. I, I could only take in so much. And um, I think in 20, when I started my program or what led me to, to start my program was just that understanding that I could actually take into account the new approach, you know, what was now data science and, um, and do something interesting with it. And also, you know, up to that point, I'd had a bachelor's and I really, the, it seemed like data science fit me uh, inherently because it, I had already had the, um, the database background, data skills, software engineering skills, statistical skills, and business skills as well. And data science seemed like that perfect munging of my background. And um, getting a, a master's in, um, at Northwestern was a way to kind of bring everything together. Um, and I hope that answered your question, John. And then also I'm saying that <clears throat> um, Bama, Bama B, uh, Robertson. So sh they're asking, in your experience, what are the top four or five factors impeding successful data science team projects? Um, I'd say the ML ops is is one of those, and why? And you guys can Google that um, ML ops and um, what that is, and I'd say the lack thereof. And it's really about okay. So you have you you develop a um, uh, a model. You, you you finally get the the data. You get you know maybe called create a data warehouse, and maybe you um, you you create a model that identifies something. A moment in time, it works. But what happens when the data changes, or the there's a need to tweak the model? Well, how do you deal with that? And how do you um, make put it into production so that it's a usable model? And how do you manage version controlling and things of that nature? That it's that next step that's the biggest hurdle, and that's where. Um, you know, as a data scientist, um, it becomes part of that learning curve to be able to understand not just data science, but also the technology and understand the um, architecture to to build the pieces to put things in motion. And um, I, would, I won't go into four or five topics, but I think just that in, in itself covers a lot of different um, different uh, um, things. So, okay, so how am I doing? Any other, any other voices want to ask a, any, any person want to ask a question? Oh. Hello. Hey. Uh my name is Kevin. I'm a computer scientist at Southeastern. Uh, there's a new concentration at Southeastern, and it is a data science, and they talk about handling uh, big data a lot. Yeah, what's up, John? Uh, they're handling big data a lot, and I'm kind of curious if you can give me like maybe a few examples of what that big data might be. Okay. Um, yeah. I'll do with it. Okay. Well, yeah, big data. I mean, by I when I think of big data. <clears throat> there's like the three B's, three V's, you know, and I think that it's turned into five, you know, it's, I feel like it's almost an interview question in a way, but um, the volume, velocity, veracity, um, value, and I think I'm missing something else. Yeah, I won't worry about it. <laughs> but um, um, so th th those are the descriptors of big data. Um, one of the ways that we see big data could be, um, um, say, video an analytics, where we develop, a, a, say, a deep learning algorithm to identify uh, objects in real time. Um, and, y you know, there's, there's tools out there that, that do this. But let's say you had a, 
I think MATLAB has some cool, um, um, you know, public um, libraries that you can use that will, you know, you scan the video, a camera over objects and then it identifies, it puts a label or probability of what that item is. And then the power of understanding that, um, you know, you put that into practice, that could be autonomous driving, meaning a car that drives itself because it can see the road, identify the road, and then um, the mechanisms, obviously, you think about Tesla and think about all the different sensors on Tesla and how it brings in that information and is able to move a car through three dimensions um, and think about the computing power that, that's, that's required. And think about also um, how that model's trained and how it's not perfect and how it needs to be improved over time. So when you think about big, big data, that's that's definitely um, an example of big data. Another example might be um, audio recognition, being able to identify a person's voice, not only what they're saying, but understand the difference between one person and another, um, being able to train. Um, uh, train, um, train, be, training a model to recognize those things could have other impl implication, implications for um, security and um, or just service related. So I think those are a few examples. I hope that helps. Any others? So I'm I'm not gonna let you go uh, without asking more questions, Ishmael. Sorry. Okay. All uh, right. So I, I've never taken a data science or machine learning class in my entire life, despite having t taught a few courses. Uh, uh -huh. it's such an an amazing uh, tool for me. Uh, but the the way I've kind of used ML has always been as a as a tool to to create some or add some value in another area. Uh, for the students that are here, are there any minors that you would recommend that help uh, augment uh, the student's ability to uh, apply data science? It may be in a future career, but, but maybe it's, it's a way to sort of better express uh, the knowledge and skills of data science. Do we, is there any minor that stands out for you that, that might augment machine learning and data science? Um, well, I think there's a couple things. Business, whatever business knowledge is being applied, I think that helps. Um, and it depends on the industry you're going into. Because a lot of the, um, a lot of the ways that, um, Tech, the industry is going as far as data science is more a specific data scientist. So if a person knows, um, you know, business or in general, or, you know, like airline industry or advertisement industry or there, and customer bases. And if you have a, a good understanding of your client and what they, how they, it really comes up, but I guess it really comes back to that Venn diagram. And you, you know, you can see that what we can easily identify with are the, you know, the programming skills and the statistics. And those are technologies that we can really see, but then that soft skill and also the business skill that, that third, Venn diagram, that third circle, that's where I would consider that would be another minor, for example, that you could um, enhance a person's capabilities. Um, you know, if they understand the airline industry, for example, um, how airlines or even logistics, uh, logistics would be huge, uh, logistics in the context of a certain industry, you know, 
Um, and then once you, if you understand, you know, how an airline operates, what they do, how the flights come in, how they're assigned, if you understand that, that process, then you can understand how to um, apply um, AI to facilitate and improve um, processes. Um, and, um, you know, it goes for many, many fields. I think, uh, you know, this wouldn't be a minor, but um, it's actually the flip side where maybe data science was the minor was um, some of my colleagues um, were actually doctors uh, in medical school or not so in medical school. I'm sorry. They were practicing doctors and what they uh, getting a master's was just a, another way to keep themselves busy, I guess. <laughs> they didn't have enough to do. But um, I, okay, um, I want to say data science, dude, uh, I want to, you know, as part of my data science curriculum, what I want to do is be able to um, see if I can uh, monitor my patients using, um, um, you know, at the time, um, all the rage was the, you know, the Fitbit watches and um, health, like the tech, uh, biotech uh, monitoring devices, um, be able to take that technology and then be able to manage out care, um, uh, patient out care and, 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 and manage your, your patient's health by collecting real-time information on your, your patients and seeing how they're, they're doing outside of your, um, your office and, um, and seeing if that could, um, you know, speed up the recovery. In that regard, obviously that, that, that individual was, was operating at a high level where doctor, he had his patients, but he was able to form a hypothesis and he was able to, you know, gather to um, offer or, or deliver um, better service. So I guess that really underscores the continual learning aspect of things. Um, you know, getting a minor is a st great start, but it's it's also that attitude of perpetual learning that is really, 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 really important. And um, you know, I I work with um, I work with a lot of individuals with at different levels. You know, whether that be PhD, masters, or or is uh, the inquisitive nature and um, always wanting to learn. Um, so hopefully that helps, John. All right, well, thank you so much. It is now right at five o'clock, and so I just want to be very respectful of your time because I know you're in your work day as well. Um, if there's any more questions, we can we can take one more. But I really, um, like I said, I just want to be real respectful of your time. So thank you for coming. Um, it was very informative to those of us not in data science, as well as I'm sure those who are um, in that field amongst us. We have several students, as you mentioned, in that option. So um, yeah, again, thank you so much for coming and sharing your knowledge and your insights with us. We appreciate it.